Welcome, dear friends, to this third session of a retreat on reflecting with paintings. In the last two sessions, we saw the old woman praying the rosary and then her grandson, Giorgio. And I invited you to leave where you are in your own life and use your imagination to cross over into the world of people who are totally different from you. That's what Jesus tries to do in his parables, brilliant short works of fiction, where he hopes the fiction will carry a grain of truth, a story that might question our views or values. And after listening to his story, we return to our own world, wondering questioning. This week I've chosen a wonderful painting by the Colombian artist Fernando Botero. When I was writing the book it took me ages to track him down. Eventually I got him in Paris to get his permission to use the painting. I sent him the script so he could see what I was trying to do with his wonderful image and he replied graciously by return of post, love it, do it. I've been lucky to have been invited to the Philippines a number of times to lecture in universities and give a series of priests retreats and gospel workshops. I love the people and my time there and I've situated this painting as a story of an Italian missionary priest working in the city of Baguio, where I worked for many months. Several of these people in the story I know. I hope it rings a chord in you, however different it is from your own life. I've called this reflection food for thought. I just received a letter this morning which began, Dear Monsignore Portobello, since my eyes were first favoured by the sight of you processing up the aisle on a visit to our cathedral, I have dreamed time and time again of being your cook because I've never set eyes on a man who looks like he adores food like you. And I know that you would cherish my generous portions. Have you ever received such a curious offer, dear friends? I never realized I was so transparent in my affections. And while the letter was kind, written in English rather than Tagalog or Ilocano, there was no references appended or indeed offered. Neither was there any hint at the quality of her cooking or her own area of culinary expertise, only emphasis on the acreage of her portions, Santo Nino preservers. I was especially puzzled because I didn't advertise a vacancy in our colourful parish newsletter, which is produced by three wonderful graduates who are studying graphic design at St. Louis University. The newsletter is now online, if you please, and you can even download my weekly recipe, which uses only the best of local ingredients. Not much use, I agree, if you're in Greenland. Sorry, I get diverted easily, dear friends. If you look at my eyes, which tend to roam around in their own orbits, you might understand my trouble in staying focused for long. I have a look of fixed bewilderment which has always disappointed those who come looking for priestly certainty. Where was I? Oh yes, the prospective cook. I didn't whisper a hint of this to my parish council that I was hungering after a chef for the convento 
nor to the Good Shepherd sisters whom I visit regularly to pick up some of their toothsome peanut brittle and their succulent blueberry and strawberry jams just to die for. For where did she get the idea that I wanted to cook? You'd never guess, dear friends, would you, just looking at me fitted compactly into my clerical dress that I cook for myself. Although cooking, I admit, approaches something of a passion for me, living as a missionary here in the Philippines, cooking for myself is counted as a cultural oddity. The people are readily kind and forgive me, of course, being a foreign priest, making allowances for an Italian far from home who has to have some little compensation for being so removed from Mama's home cooking and the wonderful trattoria of Genoa. Don't misunderstand me. I am very partial to Filipino cooking. I love chicken adobo, a delicious stew cooked in vinegar and garlic with soy sauce flavoring. Pescado al horno can take your breath away, as indeed it did for the nuncio on a recent visit, when I cooked it for him and enlivened it with my experimental blend of spices. Sadly, His Excellency had to be chauffeured away at speed to the Sacred Heart Hospital, while they eventually calmed his choking fits. Naturally, I followed as soon as I could, armed with the holy oils if they were needed, but His Excellency insisted on no visitors. In case you might be interested, the dish in question was red snapper, sprinkled with breadcrumbs, normally baked in a thick onion and pimento sauce, though the ingredients of my electrifying sauce that caused such an apostolic upheaval that fateful night will remain forever sub secreto. His Excellency did write to me the briefest of thank you notes some weeks after his brisk departure to explain that anything remotely spicy makes an explosive impact on his innards. I haven't seen or heard of him since, poor man. And somehow I'm given to doubt if I will be nominated for the refreshment committee for the upcoming papal visit in March. Much of the cooking here is influenced by 300 years of Spanish rule. The Americans have contributed little, I have to say, apart from McDonald's and that chicken grandfather who hails, I think, from Kentucky. But in fairness, they were largely responsible for setting out Baguio way back in the 1900s as the summer capital of the country. Living here in Baguio, the capital of the beautiful province of Baguet, we live at an elevation of about 1,500 meters. So happily, it's cool when the rest of the country is frying and we have no need of air conditioning. That is why so many flock here for the summer and our congregation doubles in size. It's always a pleasure to welcome people from all over the Philippines and from abroad. And we have the most energetic welcoming committee of any parish in the Catholic world. Perhaps I should say at this point that I have very little to do in the parish except to be nice to people, which is no trial, since the Filipinos are the gentlest people in the world, and like me, they avoid confrontation. Our parishioners do everything, even the preaching. Oh, not a hint, please, to His Excellency about this, otherwise I will be in receipt of headed notepaper from the Vatican with unyielding warnings underneath. The good Lord, in his ineffable wisdom, did not bless me. 
either with an interest in theology or a gift for public speaking. This is not a problem for me, however, because we have a host of parishioners who have degrees in theology and religious education and who preach magnificently every week and oversee all the sacramental programs. Apart from saying Mass, all I do really is cook and visit the sick and the housebound. But I never eat dinner alone. I can't remember the last time I ate dinner alone because I always have a family from the parish or a little group of parish workers over for a little platter. And it's always a privilege to serve them. They are forever asking me for the recipes. So we're going to produce a parish cookbook next year designed by our clever graphic artist, Benigno, Antonio and Gabriella, with the voluptuous recipe written by yours truly. Every night the people come, there is not a family in the parish who have not relished my cooking. We talk and eat and laugh and eat and drink and eat. The Parish Hospitality Committee, God bless them, ensures that everyone is invited and after 10 years we're on our second round and of helpings. The people of the parish were truly brave-hearted when Baggio was struck with a killer earthquake back on the 16th of July 1990. The Templar, if I remember, registered 7.7 on the Richter scale. For so many nights after we all huddled in tents and makeshift shelters in the streets and the parks because we were scared it might happen all over again. So many people lost their lives, including Mariana, my beloved cousin, and Roberto, her husband, who had kindly come from Torino to visit me on their annual two-week holiday. They were killed when their hotel was ripped apart and collapsed in the quake. May the good Lord have mercy on their souls. It was the worst of times, bringing out the best in people. With the three main roads into Baggio totally impassable, we had to fend for ourselves and the parish set up a soup kitchen and shelters. We were busy, so busy those days, scratching around for anything we could make stews for the legions of the hungry and the poor homeless people. We were warned to boil the water and cook the food well because of the threat of typhoid fever and cholera. If I wasn't cooking or boiling water, I was burying the dead, many of them dear friends who had shared our table, unburdened themselves a little in the candlelight, unveiled their fragile dreams and laughed at silly stories into the night. I remember the night of the quake, it was a Monday, when Maria who plays the cello at the masses on Sunday, came stumbling to see me. She had nearly died giving birth to her only born child. I was there in hospital at the time, and now she held the crushed body of her dead son in her arms, holding him up to me like a broken promise, asking, why, Monsignore, why? What words could I say that would make any sense? I stretched out my arms and lifted her dead son from her enfolding embrace, carried him inside the convento to our big kitchen, laid him down on the huge pine table, and together, wordlessly, we washed the tiny body, cleansed the wounds, as tenderly as we could, each signing the holy oil on his forehead and hands. 
We then wrapped the body around in bath towels and I carried him into the church which was filled with people praying and laid him down before the high altar. I shall never forget the sight as long as I live. The little boy's name was Angelito and he lay there like an angel fallen from, fright, from flight too late for the Christmas crib. Some women came up and gathered Maria in their arms and sat her down on the front pew, the front pew where they held her and rocked her back and forth like she was their wounded child, breathing out the sighs and sounds of heartache, the growing lamentation heard throughout the city and beyond, throughout the land of the Philippines, eventually becoming one with a huge chorus of sorrow that cries from every corner of the world. We prayed the ancient Latin prayer of departure, in paradisum deducant angeli, in tuo adventu shushipiat te martires, et perducante in civitatem sanctam Jerusalem, chorus angelorum te sushipiat, et cum Lazaro quondam paupere eternam habias requiem. Into paradise may the angels lead you, on thy arrival, may the martyrs receive thee and bring thee to the holy city of Jerusalem. May the choirs of angels receive thee, and with Lazarus, once a poor man, may thou have eternal rest. Oh, why is it, I ask myself that night, why is it it's always the poorest people in the world who seem to be God's favorite victims. Why are the little people crushed so regularly by nature in floods, in earthquakes, in tsunamis? I wouldn't want to endure that time again, even as purgatory. It takes a long time, even for a long suffering people to sleepwalk back to routine life again. The pain lingers long after the demolition has been completed, the debris swept up, the buildings repaired or rebuilt. It takes a long time to let go of the dead, leave them to rest in peace and turn to life again. Thank God we're all back to normal now. And we pray we will never be visited again by the savagery that only nature can produce. I also thank God that I was useful in a practical way. Every day, if it is not raining, I take an afternoon stroll on the Baguio Mountains to my favourite spot, which is bare of any pine trees. And there I say a rosary for dear Mariana and Roberto, for Maria and Angelito, for all the victims of that earthquake and for those who died the following year in the ashes of Mount Pinatubo. When I think of that earthquake time in our soup kitchen, when everyone was equal in their desperation, I think of Jesus ministering to the 5,000 and see that crowd of hungry followers satisfied by the little his disciples could share with them. I am not given to pious thoughts. My daily bravery tends to be the best food guides. But I think that Jesus got it right when he made open fellow, table fellowship a great sign of his ministry, infuriating all the religious snobs who built enclosures around their dinner tables. So you needed a visa to sit down. 
I love the bit in the Gospels, unsure where it is exactly, where Jesus compares himself to John the Baptist. The good Lord says that the Baptist comes not eating bread, not drinking wine, whereas the Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and everyone calls him a glutton and a drunk, a friend of sinners. While John's disciples are set apart by prayer and fasting, Jesus' disciples are identified by constant eating and drinking. Oh, my dear friends, you have no idea what reassurance that passage is for me. Given John the Baptist's diet of locusts and honey, you wouldn't be stampeding into the desert, would you, for lunch al fresco? I wonder if my prospective cook could ever apply to John and fill him out with her generous portions. If we went on a parish pilgrimage out into the wilderness, I think we'd pack a little hamper to sustain us for the day with a few bottles of San Miguel, a cold, cool golden lager with a very pleasant, clean, hoppy finish. And the Baptist wardrobe, like mine, inclines towards the eccentric. He wears animal skin held together by a leather belt, wild. I am tamer by comparison, as you can see, and go around every day in a clerical dress, looking not unlike a midget advert for a theatrical costumier. Believe me, I would look even more ridiculous in another outfit. The kids in our school think I look like the infant of Prague, so they've nicknamed me Santo Nina, the little devils. My outfit comes from the Gamarelli Emporium, just off the Piazza Minerva in central Rome. No ordinary table, these. These people, they're not ordinary tailors, they're outfitters, yes, to the popes. Where else could I buy my Capella Saturno, my flat-brimmed clerical hat with added purple edging and that delicate little purple pom-pom to match my monsignorial sash around my waist? And since, dear friends, I wear a variation of the same old regimentals every day, I think I might as well have quality. Don't you? Our life is so fragile that it can be cancelled so quickly that we might as well indulge our little foibles. I mean, without them, how would God recognize us anyway? This truth I have been taught by the Filipino people who teach me in one week more about the living gospel than I ever learned in six wearisome years in seminary. Sometimes I have found the best education is borrowing the eyes of others to see what they see, particularly the poor people here in the parish who see with a tenderness that must be truly esteemed by God. To look at the world all by yourself, dear friends, as I used to, can be such a lonesome and grumpy affair. Wasn't it Catherine of Siena who said that you should never look at yourself alone, for alone you're always in bad company? Since I am not svelte, nor, nor ever have been, nor in God's gracious providence am ever likely to be, my monsignorial robes cover my capacious self with as much decorum as can be managed. The umbrella was bought online from Milan as a birthday present from our dramatic society who wanted it to match the dome of my hat. They said, it does look a bit bizarre like carrying around a black mushroom stool. But weren't our budding artists resourceful, as well as kind-hearted in choosing it? I am the most recognised priest in Baguio. Everyone knows me and chats with me. 
especially when I walk down Session Road every morning after Mass to head for my favourite destination, Baguio City Market, a wonderful sanctuary of fresh produce from the farms of La Trinidad and Benguet, fresh strawberries, tomatoes, lettuce, mushrooms, broccoli, cabbage, baguio beans. The edible litany goes on and on, alleluia, not to mention the array of flowers. They all know me there, of course. Some must think that I'm buying for, for the army barracks or a catering college with all the stuff I purchase from them. But in friendship, we have no need to bargain with each other. Now, well, where was I? Ah, yes, Jesus and the table. You can see why I rarely preach, dear friends, can't you? Anyway, because of Jesus' indiscriminate welcome to all sorts of weird and wonderful people, he got himself into the most dreadful trouble with the hierarchy. Those old religious fusspots who couldn't tell their Agnello from their Vitello. Those old stickers thought they got the upper hand when they dumped me, or they dumped him rather, in the killing fields. But before he handed himself over to his enemies, he handed himself over to his friends as they gathered for their last supper. He was the menu. Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Take, drink, this is my blood shed for you. Do this and remember me. And the good news is that Jesus maintains his unfailing welcome to all of us to this very day, making himself food and drink for you and for all. I am glad I follow the one who came into life in Bethlehem, the house of bread. He came into life in a borrowed feeding trough for animals. And at the end of his life, at the borrowed table of a dear friend, would leave himself behind a sacred food and drink, a broken body for a broken people. Bread at the beginning, bread at the end. My life, dear friends, is a movement between two tables between the morning table of the Lord and the evening table of the people, and I can see little difference between them. Nor, as I long, as long as I live, do I ever want to, nor ever, I pray, be left with only one.